just remember responding accurately about 50% of the time is what your baby needs. That's the key to attachment. Welcome here to Developmental Psychology 101. Except it's not boring and full of slides and things like that. It's taking the lectures I used to give as a developmental psych lecturer, professor, assistant professor, whatever you want to call it, uh, and breaking it down into layman's terms. So today we're talking, we're kind of going alphabetical with my lectures. So the first one we're talking about is attachment. So attachment kind of starts with Freud. I know Freud is a controversial figure. He's, he's got some crazy ideas that are mostly falsified at this point in time. But what Freud did was he noticed that his parents had issues with attachments with other people in life. And he kind of just went from there. Now, attachment is a bond that starts in infancy and it's a close emotional bond between two people. So a infant and a mother, a pair of romantic partners, so on and so forth. So forth, so on and so forth. So infants become attached to the person um, or object that provides oral satisfaction, according to Freud. I apologize for the lighting change. Let's just roll with it. Um, and that is usually the mother, but more kind of reasonably, um, infants die if they're not looked after. They are born too early. They cannot, they cannot fend for themselves. So they need to attach to someone, generally someone that can feed them in order to survive. And the person who can generally feed them is the one who produces milk. So the attachment first bo kind of bond is with the mother. And that may sound so cold, callous and unemotional, but at a very basic evolutionary level, this is how humans survive. This is how the race carries on because humans are born significantly underdeveloped relative to most other um, primates and animals because we have an interesting shape of our pelvis because we stand on two legs so we need to birth smaller babies to get through our small pelvis so on and so forth i am not an expert in all things evolutionary biology um this is not a lecture on that but anyways our babies are born underdeveloped they need lots of help for quite a long time so <laughs> That is basically where attachment starts. That's where, as developmental psychologists, we think of attachment. We think of it in its evolutionary underpinning. So the next study we kind of talk about is Harlow's monkeys. So Harlow is a scientist and he had these little baby rhesus come out. <laughs> I can't talk today. These little baby rhesus macaques. So in Harlow's monkeys, what he did was he took those baby monkeys from their mothers at birth, and he gave them two options. They were, there was a wire mother. It's kind of shaped like a monkey, but also it's made of wire. Um, but the wire mother gives the, ba the baby monkey milk. And then um, there was another mother, and that mother was a cloth mother. Now the cloth mother didn't give the baby milk, but it was soft, it was cuddly. It was nice to be around. And what they found was like, not what you'd expect based on the Freud or evolutionarily, like evolutionary underpinning of attachment. And that was that babies, um, monkeys, babies, monkeys, baby monkeys spent 15 hours a day attached to the cloth mother and less than one hour a day attached to the wire mother. So they would go to the wire mother for food, but then as soon as they were sati satiated, they would go straight back to the cloth mother. Now this is a really awful, awful developmental psychology experiment but it does tell us that you know we don't just need as primates because monkeys are a primate um as are we and we try to draw parallels from other primates to humans uh because it is not ethical to take children off of their parents and it's really not ethical to take baby monkeys off their parents either but anyways um what we found was that Primates need comfort far more than, well, they don't, they don't, they still need to eat, but they prioritize comfort when given a choice. 
Anyways, so then we zoom on forward in terms of theory to Ericsson. So we're in like 1968. Harley's Monkeys was 1959. Now we're in 1968 with Ericsson. So Ericsson kind of theorized that physical comfort and sensitive care are key to establishing basic trust in infants. So we need to comfort our infants, not just put them down in a corner. Now, this was a pretty revolutionary idea at the time because um, up until that point, the most popular parenting book was on the care of feeding on the, I don't know how to say it, but basically Luther Emmett Holt wrote like a famous children's book in the late 1900s, 19th century, 1800s. I don't know. I'll have to go look at the numbers. Um, and he basically wrote that like, you can just put them down and just feed them. And so Ericsson came out around this time and Harlow's monkeys kind of like made this explosive finding that, you know, comfort is also necessary. You need to give the child comfort. You can't just pick them up, feed them and put them back down. They need more than that. They need to be cared for. And so the infant sense of trust in turn is the foundation for attachment. So that trust is set up by sensitive care, responsiveness and physical comfort from the caregiver. Um, and it sets the stage for a lifelong expectation that the world will be a good and pleasant place to be. That's what Erickson hypothesized. Now, this is a controversial thought um, because lots of people will be like, well, I don't want my child to be set up expecting the world to be a good and pleasant place to be. But my friends, do we want to set our children up to have a negative outlook on life just because of um, trying to create resilience, um, which resilience is not a positive feature. Resilience is something that is born out of trials and tribulations, but in a harsh world. Now, wouldn't we wish to have a good and pleasant world with a bunch of optimistic humans that create it? Because there's this thing called the Pygmalion effect, right? And in the Pygmalion effect, essentially, if you think something is going to be that way or someone is going to be a certain way. So if you're told a random child in your classroom, if you're a teacher, is a bad kid, you're going to expect them to be a bad kid. You're going to treat them as such. And then they're going to act in that way, which then reinforces your belief that they will be that way. So if we're raising a generation of children that expect a cruel and harsh world, they're going to create an environment that is conducive to that cruel and harsh world. However, if we create a generation of children that expect the world to be pleasant and good, they're going to act in accordance with that expectation and they're going to create a world that is pleasant and good. And in contrast to, you know, world war times, we do live in a world that is pleasant and good. Um, and, you know, our grandparents who were raised in the time of Great Depressions and World War One and World War Two, this is a pleasant and good world. Anyways, that's an aside. So after Ericsson, who started like pushing the envelope, being like, we have to care and comfort for our children. We can't just, you know, feed them and put them down, came Bulby, who is kind of heralded as the like father of modern attachment. Um, he kind of just really pushed the envelope some more. So he's around like 1969 to 1989-ish. Um, so he said that the newborn is biologically equipped to elicit attachment behavior. And that's very true. Babies are very cute. They cry a lot. They will elicit attachment behaviors from their parents. And attachment behaviors are things like responsiveness, things like calm and soothing co-regulation skills that kind of stuff so he's bang on now he said that attachment is a lasting psychological connectedness between two human beings and for a long time there was the prevailing thought that once a child creates an attachment style in infancy that it will stay that way for the rest of their life now this was a <laughs> this was an essay topic that i used to give my students for years. I think I gave it to them for like five or so years um, where they had to like kind of do an argumentative essay on whether attachment is stable across the lifespan or not. And like there's definitely a lot of debate, but the 
Correct answer is no, it is not stable. So although your child may appear to be one attachment style in infancy, they can change based on your level of responsiveness to them and their interaction with the world, either for the better or the worse. So it is a lasting psychological connectedness between two human beings, but whether that attachment style is secure or insecure, um, calm, comforting and reliable or unreliable really changes over time. And I promise you, I will talk about attachment styles before I finish this video. So, um, where are we up to? Still Bowlby. I'm just looking at my slides and trying to summarize them simply for you. So let me know if this worked and if it didn't, mm, let me know. I'll fix it. So Bowlby shared the psychoanalytic view, which is kind of like your Freudian perspective, that early experiences in childhood have an important influence on development and behavior, behavior later in life. Um, and that our attachment styles are established early through the infant caregiver relationship. So I did just talk about this. Now, there is a capacity for change. If you have a really rough childhood that leaves you with a really insecure attachment and a really negative perspective of the world, it's going to be incredibly hard to shift, but it is possible. It does happen, but it takes a lot of experiences and exposure to positive relationships and things like that over time. Okay. Um, so Bowlby has four characteristics of attachment. So they are called proximity maintenance, safe haven, secure base and separation distress. So proximity maintenance is just a fancy word to say your kid wants to spend their time around you. That's where they feel safe. So they're going to maintain where they are based on where you are. Kind of like they've got like a little bungee cord attached at the waist um, to your waist and they just kind of like boing out over and over and over again. So safe haven is, I used to have a really adorable video for this in my lecture. Um, and it was where there was like a little baby elephant and something frightened him, like a big loud noise. And he was just like, ah! And then you see him sprint across the savannah to his mom who is his safe haven. So it's exactly what you think it is. An infant or child will bolt to their caregiver, will turn to their caregiver if they have a secure attachment when they're frightened or afraid. Now, the next one is secure base. This one kind of goes hand in hand with proximity maintenance. Think again of the example I had of the bungee cord. Um, children will use that base of security, who is you, when they have a secure attachment at least, and we'll get into the attachment styles in a second. Um, they will use that to then go and explore the world. And knowing that you are there and being able to have eyes on you means that they are going to be more likely to be outgoing and to explore rather than terrified and sitting in the one spot. So we love that. We love that they think of us as a secure base um, through which they can go out to the world and then come and check back in and then go back out and look in the world and then come back in. Now, the last one is separation distress. And this is the one that people feel like they're failing if their baby shows this when actually it's a sign of a good attachment. Um, it's also known as separation anxiety. So it's just anxiety that occurs in the absence of the attachment figure, which is when you drop your child off at daycare every day, most of the time they cry, sometimes they don't. Um, but if they're crying and it's only short lived before they find their next attachment figure, which is usually an educator um, or find comfort in that, they just, they don't love being se separated from their attachment figures. And you can be an attachment figure as a mother, you can be an attachment figure as a father, as a adopted parent, as a foster parent, as an educator, there are so many different attachment figures, but generally the primary attachment figure is the one who's done the most care of the child and established the most responsiveness with the child over the course of its life so far. Um, okay, where are we up to? Uh, da, da, da. So Bowlby's theory. Let's see if I can make this not dense. I'll probably read it out and then re-explain it. So when children are raised with confidence that their primary caregiver will be available to them, they're less likely to experience fear than those who are raised without such conviction. So that's kind of self-explanatory, right? When kids know that they have someone there to support them and that they can turn to in times of trouble, 
they're more likely to experience a world that's full of color and opportunity than someone who feels like there isn't anyone there to look after them as they've been raised. So really showing that you're there, comforting your child, responding to your child, creates an independent child who has less fear of the world because they have a more positive idea. We call it a schema of the world in which they live. Now, this confidence is forged during a critical period of development, infancy to early childhood. It remains relatively unchanged for life. Again, this part of Bobby's theory has been mostly falsified. You can change. It's hard, definitely, but it can be changed. Um, confidence and expectations are directly tied to past experiences with the caregiver. Now, this is true. So oftentimes people really talk about in when, when educating parents on attachment is having a consistent pattern of responding. Now, research from the circle of security folks um, who run like the biggest intervention on like teaching parents, educators, the world, um, attachment, find that you need like maybe 50% or 40% accurate responsiveness in order to develop a secure attachment in your child. And I keep like leading with like, secure versus insecure attachment. I know it's really annoying, but that's the way I have my slides set up and it's probably not the way I should do this, but it's the way we're doing it, okay? Um, so yeah, you have to respond to your child only about 50% of the time correctly to get their, like what they want correctly addressed 50% of the time. Um, and that includes requests for things like hugs and uh, closeness and middle of the night wakings, things like that. Okay, so um, there are four phases to attachment um, across that first year-ish to two years of life. So the first phase is from like birth to two months. Um, and in this stage, infants, they like faces. They orient to humans. They have a preference for faces. They actually have a preference for faces in the womb when you do like little light arrays. So if you like do a bunch of lights on a mum's pregnant belly um, in the shape of a face or the shape of something else, they significantly more prefer the human face. So human infants come out preferring human faces probably because it's what keeps them alive. So they will orient human figures, doesn't matter who they are, strangers, siblings, parents, they're all pretty likely to elicit something like smiling from a baby. Um, so don't feel offended if it's not just you that yields smiles from your baby. The next phase is um, two to seven months. So phase two is two to seven months. And in that attachment becomes focused on one figure. And that's usually the primary carer. That's the one who spends the majority amount of time with the infant, which is commonly the parent that feeds the baby. If you're breastfeeding, if you're a breastfeeding mother, that's you. Um, if you are completely 50, 50, I have no idea. I'm sure there's research on it, but I have not seen it. Um, and so this is where the baby starts to like, Mm, kind of hesitate when going to other people and feel really calm and soothed as soon as they're in mum's arms. Even in birth, like even in that first phase, they still prefer the parent whose voice they heard, the the person that smells like their milk, all this kind of stuff as well. But it just starts to get more intense uh, from two to seven months. Then from seven to twenty four months, oh, there you go. It's two years. Um, of life that the four phases cover. I haven't looked at this lecture in two years, but anyways. So specific attachments develop in phase three between seven and 24 months. Um, now, because babies start to move around this time, they start to crawl, they start to walk, they start to run, they start to hide, they start to be insane. Anyways, um, so with this increase in movement, um, they start to do those like proximity maintenance and secure base and safe haven behaviors. So using their primary carer or their primary attachment figure um, as that like beacon through which they can explore the world and return to in times of discomfort or just to check in. Um, and then the final four phase is phase four, um, where from 24 months plus, so two years plus, um, children become aware of others' feelings, their goals and plans, 
and they begin to take these into account directing their own actions. So you will find that between two and three years that persistent need to touch, to be near, to have you in their sight at all times kind of starts to wane as they start to become their own independent person. They start to be able to think about what's in others' minds. We call that a like we call that theory of mind and perspective taking that starts to emerge between like 18 months and four years. So you'll start to see this progressive shift after the age of two where they become far more independent, far less um, clingy. And that's just the way that attachment is shifting. But in that phase three, so that seven to 24 months, that's when you kind of see this peak in like... Um, separation anxiety this peak in distress when not near the caregiver um, because they understand more about the world because they can put two and two together and know that mom's dropping us off at daycare and we're not going to see her for so many hours anyways so that's that's the four phases of development that's part one of my lecture now i keep talking about attachment styles but up until this point in the literature there wasn't any like mention of attachment styles. It was just kind of like you are attached or you are not. And the way to have an attached child, which brings positive things to a child's life, um, you have to do all these things. So then Mary Ainsworth, who was John Bowlby's student, um, came along in 79, 1979, and designed what's called the Strange Situation Test. Now, she designed this test in order to allocate infants into one of three, four, originally three attachment styles, but later four after we found some strange, confusing things. Um, but basically, the test is a really weird lab test, and we don't necessarily need to get into the test today because it's not overly relevant to you as a parent or you as an educator. It's just a really, like... Some argue not an empirically, not a, like an air. What's what's the word called? Um, I don't know what the word is called. My psychometrics professor would be so disappointed. Um, but it's not really a real world applicable test, um, and there's a lot of problems with it. But essentially, they do this test, which puts like the child in a place where they have a separation anxiety series of moments plus being reunited with their mother and based on the behaviors they show when they're separated from mom and when they are reunited with mom puts them into one of three or four categories of attachment now a secure baby when they're separated from mom will cry will be upset and won't be happy when they're reunited with mom they will be easily soothed and happy again quite quickly because they know to rely upon her. They have separation anxiety because that's a sign of decent separation, uh, decent attachment. Um, and that's okay to have. Um, but then, yeah, they kind of calm really quickly when they are reunited with mom. And that's awesome. That's the kind of attachment we want. And that's about... In Western countries, it's about 70% of kids um, fall into this securely attached uh, criteria. It's slightly different in Eastern countries, but we aren't going to have time to cover that here because we're already at 23 minutes. Jesus. Um, okay, so unlike securely attached babies, you have two, two or three Two, there were two original insecure attachments and then there was a third one added later. So one of the first original ones is insecure avoidant babies. So these are babies that instead of kind of exploring the world comfortably and using mum as a secure base, they don't really do that. They show a lot of insecurity by avoiding mum. Um, they engage um, very little in interaction with the caregiver. Um, when mum leaves, they show very little distress um, and they don't really establish contact with her again when she returns. It's kind of just like, meh, like you're gone, whatever. I can't rely on you anyway, so what's the difference? Oh, you're back, cool. You're not gonna respond to me anyway, so what's the difference? Um, and that's a very harsh version of it because there are other things that contribute to attachment outside of the mother's lack of responsiveness to a child um, 
all the far. There's like a responsiveness. There's this isn't a it, attachment is a feature of a relationship, not just a child. Um, so you can have different attachment relationships with different people from the same infant. So an infant can have a secure attachment with mum and an insecure attachment with dad, um, and so on and so forth. And other things can influence it. I think the research is kind of suggesting that temperament doesn't necessarily influence attachment, but temperament does influence maternal responding to infants, which then in turn influences attachment. So it's all a bit murky, but I am non attachment expert. Um, I've just been teaching it for eight years. Anyways, um, so that is your insecure avoidant babies and you have your insecure resistant babies. So these babies often cling to mum, um, and then they resist her by fighting against the closeness, by kicking or pushing away. Um, these babies cling very anxiously to mum when, the, when they're in the strange situation. It's a novel area, there is a stranger in the room, everything feels uncomfortable, and they can't really rely on mum on a good day, so they're just not gonna let go of her, essentially. That's what the prevailing idea is. Um, and they just don't explore anything. They don't use mum as a secure base. They just, they're just afraid. Um, and they're afraid that she's going to leave. They're afraid that if they detach from her for even a moment, that it's not going to be okay. Um, so when mum leaves, they cry really loudly. Um, and when she returns, they'll push away when she tries to comfort them on return. So that's your insecure resistant babies. Now, there is um, a fourth category known as disorganized, um, where it's actually really difficult to figure out what that baby is because they show a kind of range of different behaviors and they're not simple to categorize into one of these. And there are a significant amount of babies that fall into that. I don't know what the exact numbers are. I don't have them in my lecture, which is not great. But yeah, there are four categories of attachment they are persistent across life unless a concerted effort or a significant change in life occurs in order to help change it or facilitate change through things like um, parental death um, other adverse childhood events um, those kinds of things can influence it but we're at 27 minutes so the last thing I'm going to leave you with is that the only thing you really need to know about attachment is that it is based on the responsiveness of the caregiver to the infant. So the best thing you can do to ensure your child has the best opportunity in life is to respond to your infant with sensitive care. So approach them with understanding, don't treat their problems like they are less than, um, when your infant cries, go to them. You don't have to go to them immediately, but once you have finished in the bathroom, go to them, pick them up, soothe them, try not to rouse on them regardless of their age. Just show them sensitive, loving care as a parent and show them that you're always there because then they will have this schema, this idea in their head that they will always have someone to rely on in a very big and scary world. When your child is looking a little bit fearful in new environments, you just let them sit with you. You're their secure base, you're their safe haven. And when they have observed the world for a little while, they'll probably feel comfortable enough to go and explore. So then they will use you as a secure base. They'll go and explore out in the world and then they'll come back and say hi and then they'll go back out and explore again. So yeah, just remember responding accurately about 50% of the time is what your baby needs. That's the key to attachment. And early secure attachment um, is linked to positive emotional health, high self-esteem, self-confidence, um, and socially competent interaction with peers, teachers, camp counselors, and romantic partners through adolescence. Um, but yeah, that's all you need to know about attachment today. That was 25 slides of my 85 slide lecture. Um, let me know if you want to hear more, if this was still too sciencey, and if you have any feedback. 
Otherwise, stay tuned until next week when we cover the rest of it. Bye.